A 2009 study by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development found that 11 of the 12 countries with the highest levels of discrimination against women were Muslim-majority countries. Amazingly, Muslim preachers in the West insist that Islam promotes equality and women's rights. Some even declare that Muhammad was a feminist, perhaps the greatest feminist who ever lived. Why do these preachers spout such shameless nonsense? They preach it because they know that there's a general atmosphere of ignorance about Islam and that they can say whatever they want since there's no one to correct them. I suggest that the first step on the path to reducing the gender gap in Muslim countries is an informed population of free people who will not fall for false claims about Islam and who can therefore draw attention to the real source of the problem. With this in mind, I present three Quran verses every woman should know. Now, before everyone fills up the comments section with, David, why didn't you bring up Surah 4.3 or Surah 4.24, Surah 65.4, basically all of Surah 33, let me say that I know there are a lot of relevant verses here, but there's simply too much material to present all at once, so I've selected three verses that are especially relevant to the high levels of discrimination against women in Muslim countries. First, Surah 2, verse 282 of the Quran is an outrageously long verse dealing with contracts. But there's an interesting part in the middle that says, And get two witnesses out of your own men, and if there are not two men available, then a man and two women, such as you agree for witnesses, so that if one of them, one of the two women, errs, the other can remind her. If two men aren't available as witnesses, then get a man and two women. Here we find the Islamic principle that the testimony of a woman is worth half the testimony of a man. Why is this? Muhammad explains in Sahih al-Bukhari 2658. The Prophet said, Isn't the witness of a woman equal to half of that of a man? The women said, Yes. He said, This is because of the deficiency of a woman's mind. The testimony of women is unreliable because women are, by nature, stupid. These teachings of Allah and Muhammad, combined with other problematic teachings, such as the need for four male witnesses if you're accusing someone of sexual sin, have made it enormously difficult for Muslim women to testify against men in court. According to the New York Times, human rights workers have noted that as many as half of the women who report being raped in Pakistan are charged with adultery. Second, in Surah 2, verse 223, Allah says, your wives are a tilth for you, so go to your tilth when or how you will. We don't use the word tilth much nowadays. A tilth is a patch of ground that you plow so you can sow your seed. The Quran says that women are a tilth that you approach whenever and however you want. The historical background to this verse, according to Sunan Abu Dawud 2158 and 2159, which you can read by clicking the link in the description box, is that when Muslims moved to Medina, they began marrying women from Medina, and the women of Medina didn't want to have sex in certain positions. One woman told her husband not to come near her if he wanted sex in these positions. Let's read what happened. This tribe of the Quraysh, that was Muhammad's tribe, used to uncover their women intensely and seek pleasure with them from in front and behind and laying them on their backs. When the Muhajirun, the Muslim immigrants, came to Medina, a man married a woman of the Ansar. He began to do the same kind of action with her, but she disliked it and said to him, We were approached on one side, i.e. lying on our backs. Do it so, otherwise keep away from me. This matter of theirs spread widely, and it reached the Apostle of Allah. So Allah, the Exalted, sent down the Quranic verse, Your wives are a tilth to you, so come to your tilth however you will, i.e. from in front, from behind, or lying on the back. So a woman says, I refuse to have sex in these positions. Allah's response to her husband is, she's your tilth, your field for sowing your seed, plow her however you want. Muhammad obviously took this verse seriously since he made it clear that when a man wants sex, a woman has to drop whatever she's doing and satisfy him. In Sunan Ibn Majah, 1853, Muhammad declares, no woman can fulfill her duty towards Allah until she fulfills her duty towards her husband. If he asks her for intimacy, even if she is on her camel saddle, she should not refuse. In Jamia Termidi 1160, Muhammad adds, When a man calls his wife to fulfill his need, then let her come, even if she is at the oven. Third, some women aren't as quick to obey their husbands as Allah and Muhammad demand. So what are Muslim men supposed to do about rebellious wives? Allah answers in Surah 4, verse 34. 
Men are in charge of women because Allah hath made the one of them to excel the other, and because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women are obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. As for those from whom you fear rebellion, admonish them and banish them to beds apart and scourge them. Then, if they obey you, seek not a way against them. If your wife doesn't obey you, you warn her, banish her to a separate bed, and beat her until she does what you say. Should we be surprised that, according to a study by Human Rights Watch, more than 85% of Afghan women are victims of physical, sexual, or psychological violence or forced marriage, and that more than 60% are victims of multiple forms of violence? According to Allah and Muhammad, women are stupid. They're the property of men and have to submit themselves fully to their husband's sexual whims. Those who don't are to be beaten into submission. Numerous studies show the real-world impact of these teachings, and yet we're told by politicians, reporters, and Muslim groups that the discrimination against women in Muslim countries has nothing to do with Islam. Unfortunately for Islam's defenders, this discrimination against women was clear during the time of Muhammad. In Sahih al-Bukhari 5825, Muhammad's child bride Aisha sees a woman whose Muslim husband beat her so severely her skin turned green. Aisha takes the woman to Muhammad and says, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. This is Aisha, Muhammad's favorite wife, who's called the mother of the faithful, saying that Muslim women were being treated worse than pagan women. Why were Muslim women being treated so horribly? Here's why. Here's why. And if you're expecting Muhammad to punish the man who beat his wife until her skin turned green, you haven't been listening. Muhammad rebuked the woman for being a bad wife. So Muslim women were viciously oppressed in the earliest Muslim community, and here we are 14 centuries later, and the situation hasn't changed. Why hasn't it changed? Because many Muslim communities today take that first Muslim community as their model. They take the teachings of Muhammad and the Quran as authoritative. If we want to see lasting change in our lifetimes, we have to challenge the pattern laid down by Muhammad and the Quran. So learn these three verses, share them with your friends, share the video.